something in front of me here. And we're reading from the end of days. Zechariah Stitcher, we're going to pick it up where we left off last time. Until another tablet with the el eligible lines is discovered, we shall not know for sure whether Enlil's celestial symbol in the cedar forest was a specially selected living bull decorated and embellished with gold and precious stones or a robotic creature, an artificial monster. What we do know for certain is that upon its slaying, Ishtar and her abode set up a wail all the way to Anu in the heavens. The matter was so serious that Anu, Enlil, Enki, and Shamash formed a divine council to judge their comrades. Only Enkidu ended up being punished and to consider the slaying's consequences. The ambitious Inanna, or Ishtar, had indeed reason to raise a wail. The invincibility of Enlil's age had been pierced, and the age itself was symbolically shorted by the cutting off of the bull's thigh. Marduk's attempt to establish an alternative space facility was not taken lightly by the Enlilites. The evidence suggests that Enlil and Ninurta were preoccupied with establishing their own alternative space facility, and other on the other side of the Earth, in the Americas, near the post-alluvial sources of gold. This absence together with the Bull of Heaven incident ushered in a period of instability and confusion in their Mesopotamian heartland, subjecting it to incursions from neighboring lands. People called Gutians and the Elamites came from the east. Semitic-speaking people came from the west. But while the Easterners worshipped the same Enlilite gods as the Sumerians, the Amuru, the Westerners, were different. Along the shores of the Upper Sea, the Mediterranean, and the lands of the Canaanites, the people were beholden to the Inkiite gods of Egypt. Therein lay the seeds, perhaps to this day, of holy wars undertaken in the name of God, except that different peoples had different national gods. Right, because these motherfuckers were going everywhere, setting themselves up as gods, setting up old franchises everywhere they went, and then warring over which franchise you know, was the best. Gee, that sounds like our corporate model that we use to this day, doesn't it? No, that's just a coincidence, I'm sure. It was Inanna who came up with the brilliant idea. It can be described as, if you can't find them, invite them. One day, as she was roaming the skies in her sky chamber, it happened circa 2360 BCE, she landed in a garden next to a sleeping man who caught her fancy. And uh, my friend Delphi, when she was in Saudi Arabia, they, they she was someplace there over there, and they, they told her that this place she was at was where Anana landed. And that's literally how they say it, you know. And, you know, religious people, it's like, oh, she landed there. Now that's where she, you know, was born or where she came. She landed, literally like, you know, landing in a ship. And that's just how people say it there. Isn't that crazy? And they literally just say these people landed there. She landed in a garden next to a sleeping man who caught her fancy. She liked the sex. She liked the man, and he was a Westerner speaking a Semitic language. As wrote later in his memoirs, he knew not who his father was, but knew that his mother was an Intu, a god's priestess who put him in a reed basket that was carried by the river's flowing waters to a garden tended by Aki the irrigator, who raised him as a son. The possibility that the strong and handsome man could have been a god's cast-off son was enough for Inanna to recommend to the other gods that the next king of the land should be this Amaru. When they agreed, she granted him the epitaph name Sharu Kin, the old cherished title of Sumerian kings. Not stemming from the previous recognized royal Sumerian lineages, he could not ascend the throne in any one of the olden capitals, and a brand new city was established to serve as his capital. It was called the Agade, the Union City. Our textbooks call this King Sargon of Akkad and his Semitic language Akkadian. His kingdom, which added northern and northwestern provinces to ancient Sumer, was called Sumer and Akkad. Sargon lost little time in carrying out the mission for which he was selected to bring the rebel lands under control. Hymns to Inanna, henceforth known by the Akkadian name Ishtar.
<coughs> had her tell Sargon that he would be remembered by the destruction of the rebel land, massacring its people, making its rivers run with blood. Sargon's military expeditions were recorded and glorified in his own royal annals. His achievements were summarized in the Sargon Chronicles thus. Sharu Kin, king of Agade, rose to power in the era of Ishtar. He left neither rival nor opponent. He spread his terror-inspiring awe in all of the lands. He crossed the sea in the east. He conquered the country of the west in its full extent. The boast implies that the sacred space-related site, the landing place deep in the country of the west, was captured and held on behalf of Inanna or Ishtar, but not without opposition. Even texts written in glorification of Sargon state that in his old age, all the provinces revolted against him. Counter annals recording the events as viewed from Marduk's side reveal that Marduk led a punishing counteroffensive. On account of the sacrilege Sargon committed, the great god Marduk became enraged. From east to west, he alienated the people from Sargon and punished them with an affliction of being without rest. Sargon's territorial reach, it needs to be noted, included only one of the four post-alluvial space-related sites. Only the landing place in the Cedar Forest. Sargon was briefly succeeded on the throne of Samir and Akkad by two sons, but his true successor in spirit and deed was a grandson named Naram Sin. The name meant Sin's favorite. But the annals and inscriptions concerning his reign and military campaign show that he was, in fact, Ishtar's favorite. Texts and depictions record that Ishtar encouraged the king to seek grandeur and greatness by ceaseless conquest and destruction of her enemies, actively assisting them on the battlefields. Depictions of her, which used to show her as an enticing goddess of love, now showed her as a goddess of war bristling with weapons. It was not it was warfare not without a plan, a plan to counter Marduk's ambitions by capturing all the space-related sites on behalf of Ishtar. The lists of cities captured or subdued by Naram Sin indicate that he not only reached the Mediterranean Sea, assuring control of the landing place, but also turned southward to invade Egypt. Such an incursion into Inkyite domains was unprecedented, and it could take place a careful reading of the records reveals because Inanna and Isht Ishtar had formed an unholy alliance with Nurgle. And when I was in the uh, world's largest Masonic cathedral in Gu Guthrie, Oklahoma, they had a, uh, an Assyrian room there. I've got pictures of it. And uh, it was closed to the public at that time because they were doing renovations on it. And uh, the guy who was leading the tour was a Mason. And we told him we came all the way from Dallas. And he said, yeah, you know what? I'll take y'all in there and let y'all see it. And he took us in there to see it, and I've got pictures of it. There's, there, there was depictions of Nurgle on the wall. Um, so if, uh, if Inanna creating a, a, an alliance with Nurgle is an unholy alliance, um, then why are the Freemasons, you know, depicting him in, in such a grandiose, grandiose way uh, as if they're worshiping him inside of their Masonic lodges. Well, I mean, my goodness. So it's an unholy union, so the, the Masons have to have Nurgle in there? Hmm. Marduk's brother who espoused and on his sister uh, was Nurgle, and the, the thrust into each of also required entering and crossing the neutral sacred region in the Sinai Peninsula where the spaceport was located. Another breach of the Olden Peace Treaty. Boastful Naram Sin gave himself the title, the King of the Four Regions. Uh, it, it, um, I don't know if any of you, I don't have a PDF copy of this. Uh, I just got one off of Amazon. I just went ahead and paid for it and got it so I could read it. But uh, if you have a copy of this book, um, look at, I'm on the page where it has a drawing uh, with a number on it, figure 16 underneath it. And there's two drawings of, of some Sumerians up there. The one on the right looks very reptilian. And I guess this is supposed to be the one that's uh, portraying Nurgle. That's pretty interesting. We can hear the protests of Enki. We can read texts that record Marduk's warnings 
It was all more than even the Inlilite leadership could condone. A long text known as the Curse of the Agade, which tells the story of the Akkadian dynasty, clearly states that its end came about after the frowning of the forehead of Enlil. And so the word of Ikur, the decision of Enlil from his temple in Nippur, was to put it to an end. The word of Ikur was upon Agade, to be destroyed and wiped off the face of the earth. Naram Sin's end came circa 2260 BCE. Texts from that time report that troops from the territory in the east called Gutium, loyal to Ninurta, were the instrument of divine wrath. Agade was never rebuilt, never resettled. That royal city, indeed, has never been found. And, see, it's those kind of things that make me wonder if that's what, you know, places like the Rock Wall and other these things that have been covered up in the United States could be. These ancient sites that were wiped off and, you know, the rulers don't want there to be any record of it. The saga of Gilgamesh at the start of the third millennium BCE and the, and the military forays of the Akkadian kings near the end of that millennium provide a clear background for that millennium's events. The targets were the space-related sites by Gilgamesh to attain the gods' longevity and the kings beholden to Ishtar to attain supremacy. Without doubt, it was Marduk's Tower of Babel attempt that placed the control of the space-related sites at the center of the affairs of gods and men. As we shall see, that centrality dominated much, if not most, of what took place later. The Akkadian phase of the war and peace on Earth was not without celestial or messianic aspects. In his chronicles, Sargon's titles followed the customary honorific overseer of Ishtar, king of Kish, great N.C. of Enlil. But he also called himself anointed priest of Anu. It was the first time that being divinely anointed, which is what Messiah literally means, appears in ancient inscriptions. Now, that's important. Marduk, in his pronouncements, warned of coming upheavals and cosmic phenomena. Now, that's interesting. Um, cosmic phenomena and, and upheavals being uh, related together, because that's what's said about, um, about the supposed planet uh, Vulcan, that people have kind of, you know, turned into this meme of Nibiru when, you know, there's actually documented stuff of this being a, uh, uh, you know, uh, an actual thing. I'm sorry, I lost track here. The day shall be turned into darkness. The flow of the river water shall be disarrayed. The land shall be laid to waste. The people will be made to perish. Looking back, recalling similar biblical prophecies, it is clear that on the eve of the 21st century BCE, gods and men expected a coming apocalyptic time. So that's an interesting thing. So during that, so during the time period that was happening, uh, when we were living in now, that was happening during the uh, BCE times, they were expecting an apocalypse, just as we are now. So that's the end of chapter two. I'd like to get into some of chapter three for you here tonight. Egyptian prophecies and human destinies. The end of days by Zachariah Sitchin. In the annals of man on earth, the 21st century BCE saw in the ancient Near East one of the civilization's most glorious chapters. Known as the Ur-3 period, it was at the same time the most difficult and crushing one for it witnessed the end of Sumer in a deathly nuclear cloud. And after that, nothing was the same. Those monumentous events, as we shall see, were also the root of the Messianic manifestations that centered on Jerusalem when BCE turned to AD some 21 centuries later. The historic events of that memorable century, as all the events of history, had their roots in what had taken place before. Of that, the year 2160 BCE is a date worth remembering. The annals of Samir and Akkad from that period record a major policy shift by the Enlilite gods. In Egypt, the date marked the beginning of changes of political religious significance, and what occurred in both zones coincided with a new phase in Marduk's campaign to attain supremacy. 
Indeed, it was Marduk's chess-like strategy maneuvers and geographic movements from one place to another that controlled the agenda of the era's divine chess game. His moves and movements began with a departure from Egypt to become in Egyptianized Ammon, also written Ammon or Amen. Amen. The date of 2160 BCE is considered by Egyptologists to mark the beginning of what is designated the first intermediate period, a chaotic interval between the end of the Old Kingdom and the dynastic start of the Middle Kingdom. During the thousand years of the Old Kingdom, when the religious political capital was Memphis in Middle Egypt, the Egyptians worshipped the Ptah pantheon, erecting monumental temples to him, to his son Ra, and to their divine successors. The famed inscriptions of the Memphite pharaohs glorified the gods and promised an afterlife for the kings. Reigning as the gods' surrogates, those pharaohs wore the double crown of Upper, the upper, the southern, and the lower northern Egypt, signifying not just the administrative, but also the religious unification of the two lands. Unification attained when Horus defeated Seth in their struggles for the Ptah Ra legacy. And then in 2160 BCE, that unity and religious certainty came crashing down. The turmoil saw a, saw a breakup of the Union, abandonment of the capital, attacks from the south by the Theban princes to gain control, foreign incursions, desecration of temples, and a collapse of, raw, of law and order, droughts, famines, and food riots. Those conditions are recalled in a papyrus known as the Emanations of Ifu Wer a long hieroglyphic text that contains several sections in which it gives an account of calamities and tribulations. It blames an unholy enemy for religious wrongdoing and social evils and calls on the people to repent and resume their religious rights. A prophetic section describing the coming of a Redeemer and another that extols the ideal times that will follow conclude the papyrus. At its start, the text describes the breakdown of law and order and of a functioning society a situation in which the doorkeepers go and plunder, the washman refuses to carry his load, robbery is everywhere, a man regards his son as an enemy. Though the Nile is in flooding, is in flooding and irrigates the land, no one plows, grain is perished, the storehouses are bare, dust is through the land, the desert spreads, women are dried up, no one can conceive, the dead are just thrown into the river, the river is blood. The roads are unsafe. Trade has ceased. The provinces of Upper Egypt are no longer taxed. There is civil war. Barbarians from elsewhere have come to Egypt. All is in ruin. Some Egyptologists believe that at the core of those events lay a simple rivalry for wealth and power. An attempt, successful in the end, by Theban princes from the south to control and rule the whole country. Lately, studies have associated the collapse of the Old Kingdom with a climate change that undermined a society founded on agriculture, caused food shortages and food riots, social upheaval, and collapse of authority. But little attention has been paid to a major and perhaps the most important change. <coughs> in the texts, in the hymns, in the honorific names of temples, it was no longer Ra, but from then on, Ra Amun, Amun Ra, who was henceforth worshipped. Ra became Amun, Ra the Unseen, for he was gone from Egypt. Uh, right, kind of like in the movie Stargate. It was indeed a religious change that caused the political and societal breakdown. The unidentified Upu Wer wrote, We believe that the change was Ra becoming Amun. The upheaval began with a collapse of religious observances and manifested itself in the defiling and abandonment of temples where the place of secrets had been laid bare. The writings of the August enclosure had been scattered. Common men tear them up in the streets. Magic is exposed. It is in the sight of him who knows it not. So, so their shit got, their, their secrets and their magic got exposed to the common man. Oh, heaven forbid that. The sacred symbol of the gods worn on the king's crown, the Uraeus, the divine serpent, uh, right, the serpent eating its tail, is rebelled against. Religious dates are disturbed. Priests are carried off wrongfully. After calling on the people to repent, to offer incense in the temples, 
to keep the offerings to the gods, the papyrus called on the repenters to be baptized, to remember to immerse. Then the words of the papyrus turn prophetic in a passage that even Egyptologists call truly messianic. The admonitions speak of a time that shall come when an unnamed savior, a god king, shall appear. Starting with a small following of him, men shall say, he brings coolness upon the heart. He's a shepherd of all men. Though his herds may be small, he will spend the days caring for them. Then he would smite down evil. He would stretch forth his arms against it. People will be asking, where is he today? Is he then sleeping? Why is his power not seen? Ippur wrote, and he answered, Behold, the glory thereof cannot be seen. But authority, perception, and justice are with him. So even though, you know, yeah, that's saying, you know, you might look at somebody, you might look at th this person and think they're just nobody, but uh, that person could be the Savior. Those ideal times, Ippur were stated in his prophecy, will be preceded by their own messianic birth pangs. Confusion will be sent throughout the land, and tumultuous noise, one will kill the other, and the many will kill the few. People will ask, does the shepherd desire death? No, he answered, it is the land that commands death. But after years of strife, righteousness and proper worship will prevail. This, the papyrus concluded, was what Upper Wur said when he responded to the majesty of the All-Lord. If not just the description of events in the Messianic prophecies, but also the choice of wording in that ancient Egyptian papyrus seem astounding, there is more to come. Scholars are aware of the existence of another prophetic Messianic text that reached us from ancient Egypt, but believe that it was really composed after the events and only pretends to be prophetic by dating itself to an earlier time. To be specific, while the text purports to relate prophecies made at the time of Sneferu, a 4th dynasty pharaoh circa 2600 BCE, Egyptologists believe that it was actually written in the time of Amentet I of the 12th dynasty circa 2000 BCE. After the events that it pretends to prophecy, even so, the prophecies can serve to confirm those prior occurrences, and many details in the very wording of the predictions can be best described as chilling. The prophecies are purported to be told to King Sneferu by a great seer priest named Nefer Rahu, a man of rank, a scribe, competent with his fingers. Summoned to the king to foretell the future, Nefer Rahu stretched forth his hand for the box of writing equipment. He drew forth a scroll of papyrus and then began to write what he was envisioning in a Nostradamus-like manner. Behold, there is something about which men speak. It is terrifying. What will be done was never done before. The earth is completely perished. The land is damaged. No remainder exists. There is no sunshine that people could see. No one can live without the covering clouds. No one can live without the covering clouds. The earth is completely perished. The land is damaged. No one can live without the covering clouds. What, like chemtrails? Something happens in, 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 uh, either with the sun or maybe an event we, we do with nuclear weapons or something like that. And we damage our atmosphere and we have to, uh, you know, spray these chemtrails in the air. That's pretty unbelievable. That is pretty fucking chilling, if you ask me. I mean, he's right there. Wow. No one can live without the covering clouds. The south wind opposes the north wind. The rivers of Egypt are empty. Ra must begin the foundations of the earth again. Before Ra can restore the foundations of the earth, there will be invasions, wars, bloodshed. Then a new era of peace, tranquility, and justice will follow. It will be brought by what we have come to call a Savior, a Messiah. Then it is that a sovereign will come, a many, the unknown, the triumphant, he will be called. The Son Man, the Son Man will be his name forever and ever. 
Wrongdoing will be driven out. Justice in its place will come. The people of his time rejoice. It is astounding to find such messianic prophecies of apocalyptic times and the end of wrongdoing that will be followed by the coming, the return of peace and injustice. In papyrus texts written some 4,200 years ago, it is chilling to find them in terminology that is familiar from the New Testament about an unknown, the triumphant, the sun man. It is, as we shall see, a link in millennia-spanning interconnected events. In Sumer, a period of chaos, occupation by foreign troops, defiling of temples, and confusion as to where the capital should be and who should be king followed the end of the Sargonic era of Ishtar in 2260 BCE. For a while, the only safe haven in the land was Ninurta's cult center, Lagash, from which the Gudian foreign troops were kept out. Mindful of Marduk's unrelenting ambitions, Ninurta decided to reassert his right to the rank of 50 by instructing the then king of Lagash, Gudia, to erect for him in the city's Gersu, the sacred precinct, a new and different temple. Ninurta, here called Ningersu, lord of the Gersu, already had a temple there, and as well a special enclosure for his divine blackbird or flying machine. Yeah, the divine blackbird, the fucking... Klingon bird of prey. I'm telling you, man, that's it's all going to come out in the end. We're gonna, all going to find out we were fucking seeded from Klingons. God damn it. I'm going to be so fucking pissed when that comes out. Of all the goddamn dirty motherfuckers in the universe we could have been seeded from, we had to be seeded by fucking Klingons. Great, so we're all fucking part Klingon. I'm, that's just fucking wonderful. You know, no, nothing I've ever found in my research has pissed me off. And that, fuck Klingons, man. Klingons, no, it really explains everything for me now. Now I know why we're so fucked up as a people on this planet. We're fucking Klingons. Klingons are fucking dumb. God, man. That really explains a lot. We're exceeded from Klingons here on Earth. That's why we're so retarded. That's why we fuck everything up. Cloaked planes can't save us from fucking up our planet. Uh, where did I leave off? Yet the building of the new temple required special permission from Enlil, which was in time granted. We learn from the inscriptions that the new temple had to have special features, linking it to the heavens, enabling certain celestial observations. To that end, Ninurta invited to Samir the god Ningazita, Toth in Egypt. the divine architect and keeper of the secrets of the Giza pyramids, the fact that Ningazita, or Toth, was the brother whom Marduk forced into exile circa 3100 BCE was certainly not lost on all concern. The amazing circumstances surrounding the announcement, planning, construction, and dedication of E. Ninu, the House of Temple of Fifty, are told in great detail in Gudea's inscriptions. They were also unearthed in the ruins of Lagash, a site now called Tello, and were quoted at length in the Earth Chronicles book. What emerges from that detailed record inscribed on two clay cylinders in clear Sumerian cuneiform script is the fact that from announcement to dedication, every step and every detail of the new temple was dictated by celestial aspects. Those special celestial aspects had to do with the very timing of the temple's building. It was the time, as the inscription's opening lines declare, when, quote, in the heavens, destinies on earth were determined. At the time when in heaven destinies on earth were determined, Lagash shall, shall lift its head heavenwards in accordance with the great tablet of destinies. Enlil, in favor of Ninurta, declared. That special time when the destinies on earth are determined in the heavens was what we have called celestial time, the zodiacal clock. That such determining was linked to equinox, day becomes evident from the rest of Gudea's tale, as well as from Toth's Egypt name to Hudi, the balancer of day and night, who draws the cord for orienting a new temple. Such celestial considerations continue to dominate the Aninu project from start to finish. And uh, we're going to stop right there.
figures. It just says figure 17. I don't know exactly what page that is, but uh, anyway, we're bookmarked right there on the nifty bookmark and uh, stop right there. Wow. Good stuff, man. Um, like I said, so far, um, I, I, you know, I'm really enjoying this so far because um, a lot of this stuff is a refresher from uh, our Lost Book of Inky reading, but having it kind of put in regular terms instead of just reading the, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, the interpretations of it, it's, you know, you get a lot more out of it. But uh, I, do, I, do, I do have to say that the, the, the correlation that he made between, you know, what was going on in the BCE time period, what's going on now have these interesting correlations and the fact that they were, you know, pointing temples to it. But again, uh, you know, these equinoxes and these galactic alignments, these are things that the ancients knew. And for some reason during these times, um, we supposedly start to see massive shifts in uh, both human consciousness and in human form. So, uh, yeah, you know, like Lee asked me the other night on the show about 2012. And so to me, that's still, about, you know, the most fascinating thing because you really have to stick with stuff that's quantifiable and provable, but they don't want you to focus on that. They want you running around, you know, worry about if Nibiru is going to come and the Anunnaki are going to come and slave us again or something. Ridiculous stuff. Anyway.